Okay, good morning. Um, welcome to introduction to photonics. In our uh, last uh, lecture, we were talking about avalanche photodiodes and um, we got to the point of saying that uh, when you are uh, looking at the avalanche photodiodes, the uh, multiplication factor is a function of uh, the bias voltage. Uh, so, larger the bias voltage, more will, the, will be the multiplication factor. But we were insisting that uh, what matters is not just that number, but uh, the quality of that multiplication factor, meaning whether that multiplication factor is achieved um, without accumulating noise. right? And so, we had to uh, look at that picture on the right side, where we said okay, the noise is actually given by this excess noise factor. And if you look at the excess noise factor, you are saying that when uh, k equals to 1, which corresponds to the ionization coefficient of electrons is equal to the ionization coefficient of holes. Um, in that case, uh, even as you accumulate gain, you are also accumulating noise. So, overall uh, we are not really gaining um, much, you know, we are not gaining in terms of the signal to noise ratio. Whereas, if we say k equal to 0 0.1, up to a certain uh, multiplicative gain, there is not as much Im, uh, increase in the noise and uh, so there may be some uh, optimum operating point uh, for these APDs. Right? So, we considered that and then we said okay, um, we looked at some uh, sample numbers for silicon and uh, indium gallium arsenide sort of APDs and uh, then we said okay, let us since we started talking about signal to noise ratio, we want to look at what is noise, what does noise um, mean in a photodiode and it is in a, in a typical case, it is not just the photodiode that matters, you need to extract the current in the external circuit. So, you have to look at it overall as a, a photo receiver. So, when we look at the receiver uh, noise overall, uh, we are basically saying there will be one uh, component which is the short noise and uh, the other components is the thermal noise. A short noise is due to the random arrival of photons and the uh, subsequent uh, electron hole pair generation um, and uh, we quantify that the short noise variance is proportional to the uh, photo current and uh, then also uh, the, the bandwidth of your uh, receiver and uh, similarly, you have the thermal noise which is given by this expression, which is due to the fact that um, the electron flow inside uh, the current flow inside uh, uh, resistor uh, tends to be you know random in nature. And, uh, that actually depends on uh, the value of the resistor. Now, we will uh, uh, go further on this. The primary thing that we want to establish is when does it make sense to use an APD and uh, when are you better off just using a PIN photodiode. Okay. Can we actually define the regimes over, uh, uh, over which APD makes a little more sense. Okay. So, let us let us go into that a little more detail and uh, when we talk about uh, short noise, okay, uh, we defined it as uh, sigma i square is equal to 2 times I said E, um, but uh, your book is actually insisting Q. So, let me just switch over to Q, uh, but you, you understand the Q is just representing the charge of an electron. Um, so, 2 Q multiplied by I P, but also there is one more component um, that uh, you typically have uh, a noise component that you typically have and that component is called the dark current. Okay. Uh, multiplied by B. So, what is the dark current? Um, when we talk about these biased uh, uh, photodiodes, 
um, we are typically talking about uh, you know this barrier height this is in terms of energy. So, the barrier height is uh, V naught plus uh, V B where V B corresponds to a reverse bias right. So, the barrier height uh, keeps on increasing uh, with uh, higher reverse bias and in this sort of a scenario even at room temperature you might have an electron jumping from the uh, uh, the, the valence band to the conduction band and uh, so this is a case where there is uh, no no photon going in right so it's it's dark right there is no no photon that's incident on the photodiode but nevertheless um, you you have thermally excited carriers which jump the uh, band gap and uh, they they go they become like a free electron okay um, and that process actually depends on the barrier height because as you can see with larger and larger barrier height with a little bit of vibrational energy itself some phonon energy you can uh, uh, tunnel across that electron from the valence band can tunnel across and get to the conduction band okay. So, you have more dark current happening at higher bias voltages okay. Um, but even at uh, you know even when you do not apply a bias voltage there is a finite probability that an electron can jump over the uh, to the conduction band which is called a thermally generated carrier and uh, that can also give you a photo current in the external circuit. So, which is what we are calling as the dark current okay. So, uh, you have this sort of an expression for um, your P i n photodiode and when it comes to an A p d photodiode your uh, total noise is going to be something like this, there is a, there's a factor uh, m square multiplied by f that, uh, that comes about in an A p d. Once again I am not deriving that formula. Uh, it's a it's a fairly long derivation, um, but uh, you know uh, 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 you have that 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 sort of an expression uh, where f is um, f is given by like I mentioned in the one of the uh, previous uh, lectures. It's uh, k multiplied by m plus one minus k multiplied by two minus one over m. Okay, that's that's actually called the uh, excess noise factor. Okay, so we have short noise and we have thermal noise now, which is uh, four kBT over RL multiplied by B. So when you look at the overall um, signal to noise ratio. signal to noise ratio is uh, defined as um, your uh, signal power over the noise power. The signal power is going to be given by this uh, uh, I p square and your noise power is given by uh, now it has two components sigma x square plus uh, sigma t square that is the short noise variance and then the, the thermal noise variance right. And uh, if you write this out um, you can basically say that the uh, photo current is going to be given by um, you have a multiplicative gain as far as in, in a general case in an APD um, eta multiplied by q that is the res responsivity eta q divided by h nu is the responsivity multiplied by the incident power right. But uh, the incident power over h nu is nothing but the photon flux 
So, I can just write this as m into eta q multiplied by the photon flux, right. A flux is representative of the incident power divided by the photon energy, okay. Um, so, this the whole square divided by uh, your uh, it is 2 q multiplied by uh, I p. Let us actually uh, neglect I d, uh, uh, you know, uh, because I d tends to be uh, relatively small number. So, we will neglect that for a minute. So, for simplicity and then you have 2 q multiplied by once again uh, I p, which is corresponding to that uh, term in the numerator. So, there is actually a q that comes from there. So, you can write as a 2 q square m square f eta phi multiplied by b, right, where m square f actually corresponds to uh, the, the noise, uh, the extra factor that comes about uh, when you use an APD. Uh, plus, uh, you have your sigma t square, okay. Um, you can further simplify this, right, uh, and you can actually try to get to the point where uh, when you have, you know, very few photons uh, falling on the detector, right. Um, So, you, you have what is called the uh, short noise limit, which corresponds to very few photons no uh, actually that would be very few photons falling on the detector will be the um, will, will be what is called the thermal noise limit, because there is no short noise. You understand that uh, short noise comes about when we have a light mo more light falling on the detector, but when there are very few photons falling on the detector, then you have what is called the thermal noise limit, so in this case what you have is sigma s square is far far less than sigma t square. Uh, m, m is actually the multiplicative gain. Uh, so, yes, uh, so you, uh, yeah, I p will have uh, m, m cube, that is right. So, yeah, we are neglecting dark current, yeah. Uh, so, let us see if we can erase this. Yeah, thanks for pointing out. So, this should be m cube here. There is an extra m that comes about through uh, I p, okay. So, we can just say that when you have um, when you have the thermal noise limit that is sigma t square is far far greater than this other factor, then you know that your short noise is so low that you can afford to use an APD and increase the short noise. So, my, my uh, at in my thermal noise limit, when you have very few photons falling on the detector, when thermal noise is over here, my thermal noise depends on the receiver gain that I will set up, right. So, more the gain, more will be my thermal noise, okay. So, my thermal noise will be over here, but my short noise is over here, okay. Now, if I use my APD, I can afford to go up on my short noise without affecting the overall noise that is accumulated, 
right because this is so low initially now if i if i use an apd and increase my gain my short noise is going to increase okay but until it reaches thermal noise it's actually not affecting the denominator of and, and until it becomes comparable to the thermal noise it's not affecting the den denominator so as but but it is affecting the numerator right because your gain is actually uh, that multiplicative gain is contributing to the numerator okay so the overall signal to noise ratio is going to increase do you understand that when you have very few photons falling on the detector so that your short noise is very small compared to the thermal noise in that sort of a scenario you can afford to increase your short noise you can afford to increase your short noise by going to a multiplicative gain which actually boosts up the numerator by quite a bit by by that square uh, factor m square right and now because of that you are able to in increase your signal to noise ratio uh with that multiplication factor you have any questions on that you understand what i'm saying yes so when it becomes equal then you have twice that noise variance then it becomes significant so but just before it becomes equal that is all controlled by your uh, gain right your mul multiplication factor controls you know you have only few photons falling so you're not going to be able to do anything that uh, but you can control how many electron hole pairs you're generating with that through that multiplicative gain yes so, so with the apd we are uh, by changing the bias voltage we are controlling the m factor that multiplicating gain factor so uh, uh, through that you can actually control the signal to noise ratio so initially as you increase you just get a, a, a free improvement in the signal to noise ratio so to say right we, it doesn't have a penalty until the short noise becomes comparable to the thermal noise so intuitively you can say when you have very few photons falling on your detector such that the short noise is much lower than the thermal noise which we call as the thermal noise limit right if you have a thermal noise limited receiver it actually makes a very good case for using an apd okay but uh, beyond that in the in the short noise limit short noise limit is where the um, first factor in the denominator is larger than the second factor then in that case what happens it basically is like you have a 1 over m dependence right you have a 1 over m dependence so in that case you are as you increase your gain you are actually uh, lowering the signal to noise ratio right the short noise limit you have a m square factor in the numerator you have a m cube factor in the denominator so it overall becomes a signal to noise ratio becomes inversely proportional to m and in that case you know increasing the m is only going to reduce the signal to noise ratio okay so so let's actually try to put all of this uh, uh, together in some meaningful form so to do that let's actually say uh, you have uh, you you can count the uh, number of uh, photo electrons that's a uh, mean number of photo electrons mean number of photo electrons is given by eta multiplied by phi which is what we have in the uh, previous case um divided by 2b where uh, 2b corresponds to the uh, you know well two times the bandwidth of your photo receiver okay so the number of photo electrons will be given by this so if you substitute this in that uh, previous expression what you get is snr is now going to be given by 
uh, you have an m square in the numerator and then you have that factor um, eta eta phi uh, and uh, uh, you have a 2 b factor in the in the denominator. So, you you are going to have m square multiplied by uh, the mean photoelectron square divided by m square f multiplied by the mean photoelectron uh, plus some sigma q square sigma q square is nothing is going to be nothing but uh, sigma t square uh, divided by uh, uh, 2 b right there, there's going to be some normalization factor but sigma q square is a representation of the thermal noise but what we have done here is we have represented the entire thing in terms of number of photoelectrons so uh, that can actually give us a um, more insight into this entire scenario. Uh, so, you have S n r plotted as a function of uh, the number of photoelectrons and uh, in this what you will find is without uh, uh, A p d you are going to have uh, something like this, uh, you are going to have um, your S n r uh, increase with uh, mean number of uh, uh, photoelectrons and uh, your uh, and, and so uh, more the photoelectrons uh, more more will be your S n r, but um, if you can so this is without without uh, A p d, but with the A p d what you will find is it it, it goes something like this. So, when you have uh, low number of photoelectrons, it helps to <coughs> use an A p d, but beyond a certain point right, the A p d is going to actually give more noise if you in keep increasing your <coughs> Uh, uh, if, if you have a large number of uh, photoelectrons falling on your APD, uh, that short noise component is going to dominate and when that short noise con component dominates, then you essentially have uh, uh, you know lower signal to noise ratio. Okay. So, this, this actually this sort of a picture determines when you use the APD, you use the APD typically in these regions where you have very few photoelectrons falling on the uh, photodiode. Uh, so, this is no, no the, the number of photoelectrons um, that is right that should be m cube. Uh, so, that is Yeah, that should be m cube over there because we are just uh, counting in terms of uh, number of uh, photoelectrons. Uh, so the other question: What is sigma q square? Sigma q square. Uh, there is actually a normalization factor because we have taken two b in the denom in the numerator. There is actually a normalization factor that the corresponding to that 2 b uh, that comes into that. So, sigma q square is actually sigma t square uh, mm, multiplied by 2 b I think, I am not absolutely sure, but it is actually sigma t square multiplied by 2 b is what it will come. If you just substitute instead of uh, eta phi uh, or eta phi you uh, substitute basically uh, that that uh, factor m bar uh, then then you will uh, get this okay but the 
the primary idea is that you know you can look at it in terms of uh, photoelectrons or you can go one step before this and say uh, I, I want to look at it in terms of the uh, number of photons that are falling on the um, photodiode right so that is the, that will be a very similar picture that you see here so when you have very few photons falling on the detector then you use an apd but if you have a large number of photons falling on your detector then you're better off just using a pi and photodiode okay now of course uh, then you would say i can then use an apd in all my applications and uh, just change the bias voltage right because if i keep my bias voltage low it acts like a pin photodiode so i can actually determine where i operate right that is that is one thing that you can do but for the fact that an apd is more expensive than a pin so in applications where you know you're going to have a lot of photons that are going to fall on your photodiode um, like in uh, certain uh, sensor applications you know uh, you you may actually have a lot of photons falling on the photodiode then uh, in that case uh, you are better off with just the pin photodiode but on the other hand uh, let's say in a communication type of application where you're going long distance and you have to uh, when you have very few photons remaining after it's gone through all that distance then you may want to put an apd there because that is going to give you a better signal to noise ratio okay so you just need to see what is the relative components of your short noise and thermal noise and based on that you decide whether you want to use uh, apd or pin so any other questions about this before we move on so so far we've been talking about uh, what is happening to the photodiode we have not actually figured out what's happening in the external circuit okay so the question is um, how to extract the photo current efficiently right so we've been saying okay yeah this electron hole pairs are generated they are swept out into the external circuit and they're going to generate that photo current and we said okay life is nice and dandy right so there's is nothing to worry about but in reality you do have to worry about because let's say you take this uh, simple example of a uh, uh, photodiode which is um, reverse bias means that the cathode is connected to a positive bias let's say and uh, let's say you are just trying to extract the output through um, uh, uh, just a load resistor rl right so uh, you just take uh, v out like this so what is the problem with this now the problem is that you have a photo current that's uh, flowing through this flow, flowing through this uh, resistor and uh, when that photo current flows through this is going to be at higher bias compared to this right you are going to have a potential drop across that uh, uh, resistor rl so when photo current flows through this rl it's going to have a potential drop corresponding to ip multiplied by rl okay and that voltage drop if you look at it is acting against this vb because vb here is uh, positive right now if if this potential is actually acting on this anode side that's actually like forward biasing so through vb we are trying to reverse bias the photodiode but because of as you extract more and more photo current there is a voltage drop across the rl that actually is forward biasing the photodiode so it's counteracting the reverse bias in other words 
right? So that is actually going to be a problem because if it is contracting the reverse bias, then the reverse bias voltage, effective reverse bias voltage that the photodiode is seeing is going to keep decreasing as you go to higher and higher photo currents, as you pick up more and more light. Okay. So let us just represent this through the uh, what we are previously looking at as your uh, IV characteristics. Right. And uh, what we said previously is the IV characteristics are like this and as you increase your um, the light that is falling on the photodiode, you are going to have a corresponding increase in your uh, 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 in, in the uh, photo current, right? So, this is basically with respect to increasing intensity of light falling on the photodiode, okay? But um, because of this, what we are saying is we are starting with some reverse bias over here, but as you increase the intensity, the photo current gets increases, I mean uh, uh, photo current is increased and that is actually reducing the effective bias across the photodiode. So, my load line, the so called load line is going to be like this. This is called what is called the load line. As I am loading the photodiode, right, the corresponding current that I am going to have is actually going to be limited by this load line because effectively the, the my reverse bias which I started with this right uh, this value V B that reverse bias is getting compromised as you go to higher and higher intensity of light falling on the photodiode as you extract higher photo current. Okay. So, my load line is like this. Ideally, you want a load line that looks that is straight, it is vertical. What it means is that even as I increase the photo current, I am not changing the reverse bias, affecting the reverse bias. So, how can you achieve that? The way you can achieve that, I am running out of time, so I will just quickly mention this and I will stop here, is by going for, for an um, op amp based circuit. So, you typically connect the negative of the op amp and uh, the positive terminal is at uh, um, virtual by a uh, virtual ground and then you have a feedback resistor R f over here. Okay. So, this one is called a transipedance amplifier because the output is uh, given by R f multiplied by I p, it is it's converting a photo current generated due to light falling on the detector just the same way this is, right. It is converting the photo current to an output voltage. So, that is that's, that's why it is called a uh, trans impedance amplifier. In short, it is called T i a. Okay. In this case, what is different? What is different is, you are trying to push a photo current into this op amp. The op amp, an ideal op amp would not allow any photo current, any current to flow into the terminals, right. And it will always try to uh, keep the potential at both these points potential difference to be 0. How does it keep the potential difference to be 0? It basically generates a, a current, it sources current at the output which actually you know flows through this and then it, it, it negates that potential uh, that, that you have over here, right. So, that is how you see this V out as minus R f into I p. So, irrespective of whatever current it generates, right 
as long as this op amp has the capability to negate that op amp is able to source a current to negate that you're going to be fine if you have come into a condition where you are generating much more photo current than what the op amp can supply then you are in trouble but that usually doesn't happen because the photo currents that you generate are in the order of milliamps and the op amps can easily uh, you know uh, uh, provide tens of milliamps okay so in 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 this sort of a case you do not have a loading like this instead your load line uh, will be will be like this or if you keep a bias it will be like this it will be just a vertical line okay so you're not compromising your bias while uh, you are uh, extracting more photo current so in uh, um, most of these uh, conventional applications you use a transipedance amplifier as the way of extracting photo current and converting it to a external uh, thing there are some very special cases uh, when you uh, when you want to have very high um, bandwidth very high very good response um, in an op amp based circuit you are always going to be limited by what's called the gain bandwidth of your op amp meaning the bandwidth that the op amp that can provide for even say unity gain is going to be limited so beyond that bandwidth you cannot use that op amp right for this purpose whereas um, in those sort of cases <coughs> you you can use the uh, what is called the direct loaded configuration um, and uh, uh, so you would see that high speed circuits where you want want to have gigahertz type of bandwidth you use a direct loaded configuration whereas relatively lower speed circuits you go for a transipedance amplifier 